intellectual forum series and welcome to my talk. And as a visiting scholar at the MIT Historical and Curtis of Architecture program in 2014 and 2016, I am very happy to be here again and delighted to be with you. I am here to discuss why we need feminist practice in architecture history today. And in order to discuss these issues in particular, I will focus on historical, a historical turning point of the integrations of women students into architecture education in the, end, in the United States in the end of the 1960s. Because the history of this integration is one of the core issues to understand how the dominance of the male-dominated understanding began to transform into equitable, inclusive and diverse perspective in the history of academia, profession and practice in architecture. With this aim, more specifically, I will concentrate on the School of Architecture at the Princeton University having the reputations of being old boys schools in the end of the 1960s. And on this basis, my talk is divided into four parts. To start with, firstly, I will look at some discussions on feminist architecture history and recent reports and data in architecture. Then, secondly, and more specifically, I'll be talking about a brief history of early women education at old boys schools and then a brief history of the School of Architecture at Princeton University. And thirdly, I will focus on early three women architects from Princeton University School of Architecture. And finally, I will share and discuss my findings. As a feminist scholar in architecture and, and Istanbul in between West and East, my scholarly and the year in the United States began when I was a special Turkish fellow at Harvard University in 2006 and 2007. And I opened my eyes to, the, to a multicultural, diverse and global, global scholarly community and society in Cambridge here. In this respect, I would like to begin my talk with sentences by Professor Drew Faust, who became Harvard's first woman president in 2007 since its establishment. I think that her sentences help us to remember gender politics in the 1960s and how it is possible to challenge conventional gender expectation, the limitation and barriers in higher education and academia through her own experience. When I arrived excited to begin my freshman year in the fall of 1964, everything at Bryn Mawr was open to me every space, every opportunity, every dream. Had I entered Radcliffe at the same time, things would have been quite different. And it's worth noting that I couldn't have applied to Princeton or Yale at all. A quota system for admission set the ratio of Radcliffe women to Harvard men at 1 to 4, so I wouldn't have been in a distinct female minority. The right to leave or even eat in the river houses belonged exclusively to men, women were not per permitted in Lamont Library. There were only two tenured women, an anthropologist and an astronomer in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and in all probability, I would never have had a female professor to help me see myself in her image, with a PhD and feature in the academic life. Instead, I attended a college where I was not a second-class citizen during the past 2016, claiming full citizenship. Now I would like to turn architecture. As Kenneth Frampton, a pioneering architect, critic and historian, emphasizes in 2016, inclusion, exclusion and criteria for judgment are still the big issues to expand modern architecture critical history. Indeed, history of architecture is a matter of filters of various kinds and it is still one of the significant discussion topics how to present better architectural diversity in its history as opposed to the dominance of the white heterosexual Euro-American male consciousness as Lori Brown indicates in the book Feminist Practices, edited by her in 2011. 
In spite of this critical fact, as Mary McLeod, architecture historian, states in 2004, in the United States, feminist architecture history, like feminism in general, has nearly disappeared. Few schools continue to offer classes on gender and architecture. And needless to say, architecture's problem with diversity, inclusion, multiculturalism and their representations took on a new urgency with a recent political climate. At that point, it's important to remember that these critical issues are constructed and maintained by the past and its historical representation. As John Scott states in her book entitled Gender and Politics of History, Historical representation of the past is not only a record of gender-related issues, but also a participant in the productions of knowledge about sexual differences. This representation as a participant also construct gender-related issues for the present. At that point, feminist history critically confronts the politics of existing histories and the rewriting history is inevitably begins. The first serious historical studies of women activities in American architecture and design began in the 1970s with some leading authors, architecture and urban historians such as Susanna Torre, Gwendolyn Wright, Dolores Hayden and Doris Cole as Mary McLeod states. Witnessing these significant motivations in the 1970s, Susanna Torre, editor of the Woman in American Architecture, a history of contemporary perspective, she underlines three critical issues for the progress of feminist studies in architecture and in its history in 2013. According to her, feminist scholarship in architecture is stunned and although feminism in the development of design and planning ideas has actually been most effective over the past three decades, it is least acknowledged. For her, this can be partly attributed to the, to the control on the architectural discourse exer exercised by some leading male architects. And second, institutional change has proceeded at glacial pace since her book in 1977. And third, the culture of architecture remains basically unchanged. In addition to her critical views, Despina Stratigakos, a historian, points out another critical point for today. In spite of explosion of scholarship on the relationship of architecture to gender and race in recent decades, a glance at school's public events reveals that invited speakers for lectures and symposia remain predominantly male. Lectures that address the histories of female architects or architects of color are rare and often set apart as special diversity lectures rather than incorporated into them into general programming. And within such a landscape, the recent reports and data by some leading institution and organization in American architecture, education and profession invite us to think about current critical situations of diversity, equity and inclusion. For instance, according to the new data by the National Council of Architectural Registration Board in 2017, Racial and ethnic diversity is increasing among licensure candidates, although at slower pace. In this regard, its president, Kristen Harden, states that this organization will continue to ensure their programs balance inclusivity with the rigor needed to protect the public. And more specifically, in terms of women in architecture profession, education and academia, in 2016, according to the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards, women account accounted for 36% of newly licensed, licensed architects and nearly 2 in 5 new architects are women. And in addition to this, according to the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture in 2014, 
uh, one in four working architects and architectural designers in the United States is a woman. Three in 20 licensed American Institute of Members are women. Two in five architecture <coughs> students are women. Fewer than one in five deans at American architectural schools are women. One in four guest lecturers in architectural schools are women. On the other hand, American Institute of Architects, uh, American Institute of Architects report diversity in the profession of architecture in 2016 offers us critical studies of women and people of color in the profession. According to this report, women strongly believe that there is not gender equity in the industry. Both whites and people of color clearly agree that people of color are underrepresented in the industry. Both women and people of color say that they are less likely to be, to be promoted to, to more senior positions. Gender and race are also obstacles to equal pay for comparable positions, but this is particularly so for women. And in terms of representations of minorities, the lack of role models is significant factors. And finally, in terms of the in terms of the racial and ethnic minority in 2016, according to the National Council of Architectural Registration Board, less than one in five new architects identify as a racial or ethnic minority. Now let's move on a brief history of significant turning points women education at old boys schools. One of the early attempts for women education at Princeton University was its collaboration with, uh, with Evelyn College in the 80s. However, that college closed in 1897 and the early women students became apparent at the university in the 1940s. And during the Second World War, 23 women were permitted to take a government-sponsored course at university, and here you see its news. And in 1943, five women, women arrived at Princeton University.